It's my enormous honor to chat this morning with Professor David Christian of Macquarie University in Australia. He's well, a man of many parts, but he's co-founder of the Big History Project, president of the International Big History Association, and once famously described as a guy who's right across the sciences, humanities, and social sciences, and brought it together in a single framework. And I'll let David tell you who just who said that. Uh, but David, you started, you know, like myself as a, an academic, a plain old academic in Russian history with a nifty little sideline in the history of vodka. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I was kind of wondering, did that set you up for the big history? Uh, yeah. I, I, um, yes, I was, I was a sort of ordinary, proper historian yeah. doing Russian history and teaching, teaching, teaching the history of Russia during the Cold War, which, which was ah, great. Okay. But I drifted into social history and actually one of the nice little links between the history of vodka and, the, and, and sort of big history is once reading, because I always read popular science, reading ah. that in the galaxy there are, there, if, you, if you collected all the ethanol floating around the galaxy, you could fill a goblet <laughs> the size of planet Earth. So, so there's the connection. <laughs> there's the history. But oh it was, I mean, just very quickly, it was, it was wonderful stuff, the vodka yeah. stuff, because uh -huh. the Russian government in the 19th century, it was a superpower. Uh -huh. uh, between 30 and 40% of its revenue came from the sale of vodka. So once I understood that, I thought that understanding oh tracking vodka in the villages uh -huh. through networks of great corruption, I mean, think of the drug trade today, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, then mm -hmm. to the governments. Um, and that made me realize that the Russian government, and in fact, it's not just the Russian government, mm -hmm. built their power as states by selling mind-altering substances. And that is something that I think most historians are not sufficiently aware of. Let us be very grateful you didn't get into milk instead. So, so. But I mean, I'm, I, I should explain, I'm an archeologist, um, so I've always thought history was big, big in terms of its scope, and especially big in terms of its social importance, its need in the educational system. But when you're talking big history, you, You've, you've got a very specific um, sort of agenda in mind. Now, you, can you unpack it a little bit for me? Yeah, the, the phrase big history, I, I, I think I, I coined it because I needed a sort of cute way of describing uh, what I was doing. Uh. I, I'm slightly worried by it. You know, it's grandiose, it's inflated, all of those things, but it seems to have caught on. So for better or worse, I'm stuck with it. Um, mm. Mm. But I think what, what, I mean, the project in a sense is very simple. Uh, I became fascinated with the idea of... Um, the whole of history. Uh, history as conventionally done actually is about the past on a scale of a few mm -hmm. thousand years for the, mo for the most oh, part. Yeah. And I began to wonder what the whole of history is. Um, I'd been reading Kuhn mm -hmm. uh, and was mm -hmm. very much aware of history as a pre-paradigm discipline, a discipline mm -hmm. without paradigms. In mm -hmm. biology you could ask the question, what's, what's, what's the, the core idea of biology? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what's the core idea of history and this led me to the idea of could you teach a course on the whole of history? And once I started thinking about that, it didn't take me long to realize that such a course would have to go to the origins of humans. But to do that properly, you're going to have to go back to mm -hmm. evolution, to a paleontological scale. Mm -hmm. But then to do that properly, you're going to have to go back to the geological scale and talk about life itself as an emergent property. And to do that properly, you have to go back to the <laughs> cosmological scale. So it didn't take me long to get back to the Big Bang. And, and God bless contemporary physics, it stops at the moment. <laughs> it's, I'm terrified that the physicists will find a way of getting beyond the Big Bang, which will mess my course up, no end. It's, I was going to say, it's, 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 it's probably only a, a, a matter of time before that happens. Do you ever get pushback, though, that, you know, that, no, history, history is human, history Absolutely. is, yeah, what, and how do you, how do you respond to that? There's been yeah. a lot of pushback, I mean, mo mostly from, you know, my own tribe, <laughs> that is to say professional historians. Mm. Um, not so much from scientists who very often will say, yeah, so what's the big deal mm -hmm. about, th about this? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know, my, my, my response would be that, that conventionally for the last history, for the last century, mm -hmm. we have defined history as um, the history of humans over the last few thousand years mm -hmm. based on documents. Mm -hmm. But you think what that excludes, as an archaeologist, this would be a familiar <laughs> argument, you know, if you base your history on documents, you basically end up talking about elite chaps. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and so he means chaps, ladies. Yeah, I do mean chaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so your history is very warped. If historians try to make generalizations about mm -hmm. humanity mm -hmm. on the basis of this very warped sample, that small sector of humanity that had access to literacy mm -hmm. and perhaps was literate, mm -hmm. it's predominantly male, it's predominantly elite, Mm -hmm. uh, it's predominantly modern. You exclude the Paleolithic, you exclude, all, you exclude most of the rural world, you exclude, exclude the vast majority of humans. So big history is democratic. I think it is democratic indeed, yes. You encounter, you my students encounter humans first as a species because uh -huh. they approach human history through talk about the biosphere and evolution. And I think at the moment I'm hearing a lot of talk at Davos about global citizenship, the need yes. for some sense of global citizenship. So it seems to me that big history is a very powerful way of helping students towards a sense of humanity, not as a, as a vague or cloudy concept, but as a very precise one, you know, a human community with a global history that needs to be seen as a community. So big history, uh, it, you've been teaching it for quite some time at yeah. Macquarie and I gather other people, but it, it seems like it's, it's coming together, it's coalescing, and can you tell us a bit more about the, the rollout on, on big history yeah. and how this is taking off? Well, I, I started doing this and um, I did get pushback from, I, th I, th I think I told you, I, I, I once had a <laughs> screaming match with a very good friend of mine in the corridor who said, I will bring shame on our university we will become a laughing stock. Oh, to do oh her justice, academics, <laughs> academics. Ten yes. years later, she yeah. said, okay, David, I got that one wrong. And it, <laughs> we, we're good friends. But, but so for quite a long time, uh, I felt very marginal, I, but I, it didn't matter. I was having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But um, particularly in the States, now there are probably 40 or 50 courses like this. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming more acceptable, still pretty marginal, mm -hmm. but... Um, uh, the idea of big history is now, I think, being taken a lot more seriously by, by a lot of historians. Um, and the really exciting thing for me is mm -hmm. that quote you gave at the beginning was, was Bill Gates, <laughs> because I, I recorded some lectures on big history, right. which he saw and liked very much, and um, contacted me and, and said that this needs to be in high schools, which I'd always thought. Mm -hmm. but I had no idea how you yeah, get how something you... like this into high schools. I, the bureaucratic nightmare, I could imagine, was terrifying. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine. And um, so he said, um, you know, I can, I can support you getting this into high schools. If, if, and, and so what he is supporting the Big History Project, mm -hmm. and what that is doing is creating, um, I, it's, I, I find it incredibly exciting, we're creating a high school syllabus mm -hmm. for a course about, it could be taught as a semester length course, you could spread it over the year. Mm -hmm. It'll be available in the middle of 2013 Fantastic. as a website. All the material will be on okay. the web. And once we open it out, it'll be free, there'll be no, no logins, no passwords, it'll be completely open, open access. access. Oh. And our hope is that already we're seeing a lot of interest from high schools in, in Australia and the US, but also elsewhere. What, 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 what friend of Bill and man of Ted you are, what, 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 uh, what, what, what appealed to Mr. Gates about this? What do you, what's the, does the famous academic question, the, you know, so what? You know, you know, you know. Is it a fad? It'll like new math. It'll be gone again, and you know, two, you know, two years we'll be doing something else. You know, what, what, what's? Why is this going to last? What he said yeah. um, was, you know, he is a real intellectual enthusiast. I think since yeah, leaving yeah. Microsoft, he has indulged in a passion for just learning so, uh, sub different subjects. So he, he loves lectures on e economics, on, on cosmology, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm, archaeology, mm -hmm. ancient. And, but what he said was um, that what this course did was it put it all together, mm -hmm. which is a very simple and neat way of describing what I think is the power of this. Mm -hmm. And I should say that as a teacher, I've never taught a course that has had the same power to kind of generate epiphanies among students. Huh. And I think the reason it does that is because Students go to school and university full of questions about the meaning of life. Yeah. I certainly did. Yeah. What's the whole damn thing of which yeah. we're a part? Yeah. And the experience they get almost universally throughout the world is deeply disillusioning 
it is teachers who, with the best intentions, say, look, shut up about the meaning of life. Just get on with the French Revolution. <laughs> or, or, you yeah, know, yeah. Or, or, yeah, or the yeah. difference between bases and acids or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, and reading, that's a writing, and arithmetic. That's all you need in that's life. That's right. Yeah, and that's yeah, a disillusionment yeah. we've, we've yeah, all been through. Yeah, yeah. And when someone, and I'm in the position now of being able to say, not we'll solve the problem, you know, we'll tell you what the meaning of life is. What we can say is, we can tell you a sort of universal story mm -hmm. that will take you a long way down the track of exploring the question of your place in the universe. And it will do it using the best and most up-to-date scientific information. And that sense, I think of this as looking at knowledge, as taking students to the top of the mountain. Yeah. They lose detail. Uh -huh. of course, mm -hmm. which is why this would never replace other courses, but it's a fabulous supplement. They can see how different disciplines fit together, and they can see, more importantly, how they fit into the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this course can do some of the work that traditional origin stories did. Mm -hmm. And I eventually realized that it's bizarre that modern education does not teach a universal story of any kind. And I think it's a deep failing of modern education. The story's there. It can be told with scientific rigor, particularly right. in the last 50 years, the science has got so good that you can do this. But what about um, cultures that have alternative origin stories or do not embrace, you know, the, the, the you know, big bang to us and or that, you know, religion or ideological considerations come in? How, how does big history deal with that because I know yeah. right now you're it's Australia the States and Korea Actually, but you're Korea at the moment ah, right? yeah. So how's, yeah. yeah um one of the reasons for thinking about this as an origin story right. um is precisely because I was teaching it in Australia uh -huh. I was deeply concerned not to teach it in a way that would give the subliminal message that indigenous Australians have been here for 40,000 years mm -hmm. and they never got it We've got it. That's I really didn't want to give that message. Okay. And I found that thinking about creation stories is a powerful way of doing that because, because then what you can say is that each society uses the best knowledge, the most authoritative knowledge it has, mm -hmm. to construct a map of everything. Mm -hmm. And that map is generally at the heart of educational systems. And it plays a very powerful role okay. in giving, giving students a sense of coherence mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. of place mm -hmm. and of their role. And so every society does that with the best knowledge available. We can guarantee that a lot of what I'm saying in this course in a hundred years time is going to look almost as cute as stories about rainbow serpents. <laughs> so, so an origin story is the best available universal okay. story of your time. With no claim that, to, yeah. The origin mm -hmm. stories vanished from modern education mm -hmm. about a century ago, I think you know, with this tsunami of information that we dealt with by siloizing, siloizing. you know, yeah, information. Yeah. You, sp you said, and I've, I've too, um, here at Davos, the, the global citizenship theme. I'm, uh, big history, global citizenship, you know, you've got young kids out there. What, what particular aspects of things do you take, think they'll take away from a big history class that will then play on, onward. I'm thinking about uh, bridging the humanity science divide, yes. which is something that as an archaeologist I'm very concerned to do. So, yeah. Or environmental issues or you know, awareness. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, first, it's a wonderful way of bridging the two cultures. Right. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it does it in a completely natural way. Mm -hmm. It's not a smorgasbord course. Mm -hmm. What They don't get the sense, okay, we're going to do a bit of physics, a bit of chemistry, right. a bit of history, and how wonderful is that? Okay. It, it's, it, it's a coherent story. And, and very often, you know, students, they don't notice the seams between the courses. So suddenly we'll be, do, we'll be talking about the Paleolithic, and I'll get students saying, but hang on, weren't we talking about evolution of hominids? Mm -hmm. And aren't we now talking about history? I'll say, yes. But actually, if you tell it as a coherent story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then the barriers kind of drop away. Mm -hmm. There's not the hiccup and, between. And that's yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the biggest barrier of all, E.O. Wilson, in his book, Consilience, nailed this very precisely. The biggest barrier of all is um, um, between the humanities and, mm -hmm. and the sciences. And I increasingly think it's my tribe that has been policing that barrier. Maybe your tribe as well, the archaeologists. <laughs> 
<laughs> because because yeah. it's um, because they see science as a threat. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and 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 that has all sorts of nasty consequences, including fear of science, fear of science ed education. But, um, yeah. And I, I remember with the, I'm, my impression is that educating students about thinking about the environment in a in a holistic way is absolutely key. Yes. And and it seems to me that. History and archaeology, we have quite a bit to say on these themes that you know, tend to be approached very specifically through a scientific lens. And it's like all truth about climate change or environmental change or human nature relationships is, all comes through the sciences. Complete nonsense. So I'm, well, it's, I think it's, we're I, allies I, I, I went to some wonderful sessions actually uh -huh. on, on sustainability and uh -huh. environmental issues yesterday. Um, they, they were great. I, and I, but I sat there feeling that if you can imagine a whole, I mean, our ambition is that courses like this will be in the majority of schools in Excellent. most countries in the world okay. within 15 or 20 years. Okay. Most students will know this story. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that this is a wonderful preparation for understanding so many contemporary global issues. First, mm -hmm. students will be, fam they will not freak if I say to understand climate change you need to be not worried about the prospect of thinking on scales of billions of years, mm -hmm. which is what you need to understand Absolutely. the role of oxygen. Mm -hmm. You need to be not freaked if someone says, you'll probably need a bit of chemistry, a bit of physics, but also a bit of economics, mm -hmm. a bit of history to understand mm -hmm. climate change. They won't be freaked because they will have mm -hmm. had this experience of moving more or less seamlessly across disciplines. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, and you need to think about the whole planet, the biosphere is mm -hmm. at the heart of the second half of this story. So the idea of a biosphere, of human history being embedded in the history of the mm -hmm. biosphere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will, I think, seem completely natural to students who've done, done this course. Did you road test this on your own children? Did you try them, you no, know, no, no, you know they, dinosaurs they, at breakfast or something like they, that? They, they were too old, so they I couldn't, okay. and, and, you know, okay. Yeah. Breakfast table conversations with dad wittering Do, on about you know would not have gone the right. asteroid <laughs> impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. Okay. It yeah. didn't work. Yeah. But my daughter is hoping to teach this course. She's just qualified oh. as a teacher. Congratulations! And, uh, I'd, I'd love to see her teaching. That would be great. It, I'm I'm curious, uh, and I'm sorry if it plays out this way. Australia, America, uh, are the kids reacting in similar ways to the courses, or, or is one side embracing it more readily than the other? Is it? No, no it's. Um, I, I, should, I should explain that I taught in San Diego for eight years. Oh, um, oh, actually, right. it coincided almost exactly with the, the Bush administration. And I was so I was. I wonder teaching, why that came in. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right. uh, that's just a quick way of giving the dates. But oh, so okay. I was teaching quite a lot of, of fundamentalist students, by the way, which oh, comes back to your uh, earlier yeah, question. Yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah. And um, with many of them, I was able to just say, this is a story you probably need to know. Uh -huh. It is not my job to tell you what you will choose to believe. But I can help you around oh, this story. You probably need to know it. And um, uh -huh. um, so, is there a difference? I, I'm mostly operating. Let's let's be fair. With I'm mostly working with teachers. Mm -hmm. So initially, it will be the interest of teachers. Our website is being piloted. It the first course has just been completed in six schools in the states. For me, this is incredibly exciting, and the initial feedback is wonderful. And from one example, Please. one of the pilot teachers in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, said she had a huh. teacher parent night. Uh -huh. And the parents completely dominated the discussion. <laughs> and they said, we love this course. <laughs> uh, she said, but I'm, you know, and they said, every, every, every day our, our, our kid comes home, we sit them down, we grill them. Um, and for me, that's one of the most flattering things I, I could imagine. So, you may be so, hated by all these students, you realize that. <laughs> I could be, but, but I think, yeah. no, I think the reaction no, of students, I I, yeah. I, I, my own Just students, it's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. students really respond. They don't have the prejudices against this sort of story that, right. that professional scholars mm -hmm. have. Um, so, uh, and there is huge interest amongst teachers. So I'm very optimistic that mm -hmm. a lot of schools will want to experiment with mm -hmm. this. I gave a talk in um, DC to an international, it was a Microsoft Partners in Learning conference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Teachers, very good teachers from 70 countries. In the next two days, I had conversations with teachers and I counted from at least 15 different countries saying, I want to teach this. I want to teach great. this. When can we do it? That's great. And a nice little coda to that story is te talking to a teacher from Delhi who said, I want to teach this in Delhi. And then she said, oh, by the way, you know all of this is in the Mahabharata. 
<laughs> and and, and then, then yeah. the next day I talked uh -huh. to the teacher from Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. And she said, I want to teach this in Saudi Arabia. And then she said, by the way, you know all of this is in the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> and when people teach it in, in other countries, is, is there variation in the curriculum? Or do you invite teachers to, to modify or to, to bring in a special dimension? Or, or is the, the big story is the big story globally? And Look, once our syllabus is released, I'd love to see different people right. teaching their versions. Right. I'm sometimes right. worried about the possibility that my thinking about yeah. this you know, but could, you need could, a story. You know? Yeah, I mean, it has to but be. we need a story. Yeah. Well, at the moment, it's mostly being taught in 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 the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, the pilot project is just starting in Australia. Mm -hmm. Next year, we hope to pilot it in fifty or sixty schools in the mm -hmm. U.S. And, and Australia. Fantastic. But a pilot is starting up in Korea. Maybe another one in Scotland. I'm I'm going to be talking with oh, educational okay. people in Scotland about this. Um, my hope would be that this would be the first history syllabus that could be taught throughout the world mm -hmm. without much tweaking. Right. You know, science courses, you can teach the same chemistry right. in Beijing mm -hmm. as in Rio mm -hmm. or Johannesburg, mm -hmm. not history courses. Exactly. But yeah. this one, I think, it, there may be a little bit of tweaking right at the end. So a Korean course, I can imagine Korean teachers will want, when we start talking about agrarian civilizations, mm -hmm. they'll want probably mm -hmm. one or two Korean Mm -hmm. examples. Mm -hmm. But I think the tweaking will be the minimal. Mm -hmm. It'll be a bit like the tweaking you do if you have an American chemistry course and someone tries to teach mm -hmm. it in Seoul. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, high school is the, whatever you call it in each country, is, is, is where you're targeting. Yep. Do you, but my, um, my experience with, with really interesting ideas to teach is that they can scale from kindergarten Absolutely. to Absolutely. retirement homes. And, yep. and I, I was, have, what, what are your hopes beyond the, the particular you know, school context? I, um, uh, with, with this project, we are thinking of year nine. So with 13, 14 year olds. With, and right. and with okay. the reason, the, the logic is okay, above so that, you know, most, in most countries, syllabi are more tightly locked in. Right. So the space right. at that level. Also, they're just mature enough to really get a hold of this. But right. in the last two or three years, I've been giving quite a lot of talks to teachers uh, mm -hmm. saying, you know, what a great thing this is mm -hmm. and you'd have a lot of fun mm -hmm. if you taught it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had quite, quite a lot of times, I've had primary school teachers, mm -hmm. elementary school teachers mm -hmm. coming up and saying, I'd love to teach this at this level. And frankly, I think you could teach it at all levels, mm -hmm. but just in more and more sophisticated ways. Mm -hmm. What about CEOs? Mm -hmm. I would love to. This is something I've been thinking about, is that we, we produce week-long intensives. If someone wants to get an overview of this story, mm -hmm. get a feeling for the power of mm -hmm. the story, mm -hmm. I would like to start teaching, in, in, probably in Sydney or elsewhere, week-long intensives in big history. They could be for teachers, for preparing teachers, for CEOs, politicians, <laughs> for politicians, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, um, yeah, I think this very broad perspective. I mean, mm -hmm. seeing the conversations at Davos, mm -hmm, I really mm -hmm. think the very broad global perspective that this can help you towards is something that we're going That's to need in the next fifty fine, years um, yeah. to tackle yeah. global problems. It, I mean, it's often said that the the histories we we tell or the histories we write or that we teach say more about our, our, our present and ourselves than, than the past. So for the 21st century, a big history, you see this as a positive, you see this as a, as a hopeful move in... I, I certainly do. And, yeah, and in fact, yeah. it's a recovery of something we've lost. I, because I, it took me some time to realize that I was not doing something strange. Mm -hmm. What I was doing was teaching in a way that most societies throughout most of human history have taught. Mm -hmm. They have all taught mm -hmm. unifying visions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in mm -hmm. the Christian world, the mm -hmm. Bible was at mm -hmm. the heart of it. Mm -hmm. In the Muslim mm -hmm. world, the Quran was. Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, Paleolithic cultures, you know, mm -hmm. creation myths were right. at the heart of this. Right. And it's just for a century, modern education has stopped teaching this. So I think this is a very natural move for us to recover or mm -hmm. discover a modern origin story. It's scientifically based, mm -hmm. scientifically rigorous. That is the origin story mm -hmm. that you need if you live mm -hmm. in the early 21st century. I deeply believe that. Scientifically based, scientifically rigorous, but 
with uh, but with the human absolutely is very much part yeah. of it. Is there anything? I mean, have I? Is there something you'd like to say before we we wrap up? Something that I haven't raised in 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 this conversation or a particular angle that you'd like to underscore? I think you've I think you've taken us around most of the important <laughs> territory. I mean, my my hope is that that when you know when our big history project is rolled out mm. next year, mm -hmm. this this will I I hope it will look like something that a lot of teachers will think. Ah, yes, this is this what we need. We need to teach. Mm -hmm. And it won't displace anything else. It's, it's not a threat to existing forms of education. Mm -hmm. I think it will supplement other teaching very powerfully. A chemist, a student who does a chemistry course, mm -hmm. who is actually already familiar with the idea that elements beyond hydrogen and helium mm -hmm. were all forged in dying stars, you know, mm -hmm. that there's some chemistry mm -hmm. happening in, in space, mm -hmm. that life is all about chemistry in its earliest. I mean, they will be so much better prepared to see their chemistry, not as a technical thing, but as part of a story that includes the student mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. and the society mm -hmm. the student is, is a member of. And the planet. <laughs> Folks, a view from the top of the mountain. It's been <laughs> an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank Christian. you very much, Susan. My pleasure. Thank you.